Thank you very much. And the mayor has illustrated the point with which I'll end, which is why I trust cities and I don't trust the federal government at all. Um, uh, but let's start at the beginning. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, so I'm going to um, talk about the secret to smart policies about smart cities. I'm going to summarize my idea in one word, learning. I'm really going out on a limb here. I'm going to advocate learning. Uh, it's pretty original, right? Um, actually, in today's climate, it's more revolutionary than you might think. I want you to consider the following press release from the FCC chair, Pi, and House Commerce Chair Walden uh, on a recent trip they took to rural Oregon. Here is uh, what they wrote about what they learned. And when you read it, you will realize that the FCC chair and chair of the House Communications Committee spent taxpayer money to fly across country to learn that rural government officials, healthcare providers, and first responders believe they need better connectivity. Huh. They didn't already know that? Um, to believe that press release, uh, you either have to believe that after decades of work around these things, they were unbelievably stupid or blind, or to be charitable, um, they only went out to find what they already believed. And again, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I think it's uh, B. Uh, and I don't say that. I don't want to make fun of Chairman Pai. Actually, that's not true. I always like to make fun of the chairman. <laughs> I did this for the chairman I worked for. I regarded, I don't even have a job, but I regard it as a critical part of my job. Uh, and one thing Pi and I have in common is we both think he's hilarious <laughs> for totally different reasons. But I, what I mean is I don't just want to make fun of the chairman. All the commissioners and lots of others in DC take taxpayer funded trips to learn what they already believe. They return with the same narrative, the same bumper strip solutions that they had before they took the trip. I've read hundreds of press releases like the one I've just quoted, and I've never read one which answered the question of uh, uh, what did you learn that actually changed your point of view. So when I say learning is a tool to accelerate the path to smart cities is revolutionary, believe me, that is not what's going on most of the time in DC. Well, the point about learning is that all learning is fundamentally about the destruction of existing habits of pattern recognition and the creation of new ones. The enemy is, of course, confirmation bias, because if you see the same things when the facts change, then you're not learning. And sadly, this lack of learning characterizes the current relationship between the FCC and cities. The relationship largely centers on different visions of how our country approaches deploying 5G networks, which some have said is the key to uh, smart cities. Now, this is the third speech I've given in the last couple of months uh, on the topic. The first two, which I will summarize rather than repeat, uh, focuses on how, uh, I will learn how to do this sometime, I mean, thinking of learning, oops, um, focuses on uh, how the FCC has curiously interpreted their statutory mandate to dramatically reduce its regulatory powers over private enterprise while simultaneously asserting new authority to regulate prices and micromanage over only one set of enterprises, local governments. The major tactic is to regulate cities uh, through the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee process, there are worthy goals uh, to accelerate and broaden deployment of next generation networks and reduce the digital divide. However, uh, the execution has been horrible uh, and the failures are threefold. First, uh, the BDAC um, uh, did not have a balanced membership which could have led to a real consensus between the parties. Um, Second, the BDAC started from the false assumption that industry did not have the leverage to uh, negotiate deals that needed to make in investments in new networks, an assumption which, if you actually read industry comments, uh, is, uh, the, the industry acknowledges is false. Uh, and third, uh, and this is a little more complicated, but uh, BDAC did not uh, understand how you actually create value, which is by you get parties together and you try to figure out what is it that party A can do uh, that can help party B, but doesn't cost party A much and, and reverse? Instead, what they simply did was they said to the uh, enterprises, what do you want? And they said, well, we just want uh, cities to transfer wealth to us, and uh, that's essentially what they're doing. But underlying these three failures is the failure to learn anything. Let's look at the big picture here. The FCC uh, says that 5G represents a critical junction. Our economic growth and our national security require that we lead the world in 5G. 
I do some work on Wall Street. Uh, Wall Street is highly skeptical of that. And indeed, a recent study by Bain suggested that 53% of executives at mobile operators believe there simply is no compelling near-term business case for 5G. But let's put that aside for a second and assume that it's true that millions of jobs, hundreds of billions of investment, and our national security are dependent on accelerating a mobile network upgrade. So that's a really big deal, and you would assume the FCC would debate big ideas, but they aren't. The process began with a point of view that narrowed the range of acceptable answers to only those that reduce or remove so-called municipal regulatory barriers to infrastructure investment. But if the problem is so big and important, why did the government limit itself to only considering municipal regulatory barriers? You know, for example, why didn't they take up the idea of the National Security Council um, uh, and have a national 5G network? My first reaction is that it's a bad idea, but I sure would like to know why the generals thought it was a good idea. Uh, if the FCC wanted to reduce costs, why didn't it call it with the McKinsey consultants who wrote that network sharing could save 40% of co the cost of deployment, a figure several orders of, I mean, an order of magnitude larger than the savings involved with the BDAC process? Why didn't they consider, for example, having the federal government in sense cities to build out dark fiber as Lincoln, Nebraska did, which has facilitated 5G deployment in that city? Why didn't the FCC have a robust debate about Chairman Wheeler's proposal to reform business data services by addressing the real problem, which is ubiquitous, high-capacity uh, wired networks. Now, I'm going to confess something that people in DC never do. I have no idea which of these ideas should be adopted. But I do know two things. Uh, first, they are solutions that are at least have the merit of being as big as the problem that the FCC officials describe. And second, if the 5G challenge is what they say it is, the FCC's solution will not get this country where it needs to go. The FCC's willful ignorance of a range of answers is not limited to the options it considered. Somehow they neglected, as they're saying, that uh, cities are stopping small cell deployment, that over 400,000 small cells have already been deployed, and that wireless companies have been striking deals to locate uh, small cells without their help. Uh, for example, in the city of San Jose, uh, they recently struck deals not just with AT&T but also with Verizon. Um, this, of course, um, uh, undercuts the idea that cities can't be trusted to cut deals with the, uh, the carriers. Interestingly, um, Commissioner Rosenworcel called it a model that other cities should follow. Um, uh, the folks at the FCC, were ups the majority, were upset by this, and the cities tried to salvage the situation by claiming that San Jose was a unique situation, so it's not a model. Um, think about that for a second. The industry in the FCC wants to create a one-size-fits-all uh, solution um, that eliminates local choice for thousands of cities. But when confronted with uh, a successful negotiation to which both sides got more than they gave. They say, wait a minute, that's a unique situation. It doesn't fit into a one-size-fits-all box. Um, I think a lot of cities are like San Jose. I think they think their situation is, you know, unique, and they want to find a unique way of facilitating both deployment and helping bridge the digital divide. But if San Jose is unique, then the whole premise of BDAC that the solution is to standardize and federalize uh, the way construction management works is obviously flawed. Another argument um, uh, about why the FCC should essentially federalize pricing comes from a pro BDAC commissioner who argues that we have to lower the price of access in every community on the theory that if a company saves money in market A, they will immediately spend that money in market B. Therefore, that would give, quote, every community a fair shot at 5G. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not actually the way capitalism works. And I say this having made most of my money on Wall Street. I really find it funny when I have to cite Wall Street for my Republican friends at the FCC. If the company gets extra profits in market A, what possibly makes the FCC believe that they will spend it in market B? In fact, the FCC has zero evidence to that. I, on the other hand, have significant evidence that that's wrong. Um, 
And I would point to the fact that the telco companies, as well as a lot of other companies, got a huge amount of money recently through the tax breaks. And did they spend it on CapEx? As, by the way, was, we were told that was what was going to happen. No, of course they didn't. Um, they spent it, the, the primary purpose of it was to use it for stock buybacks. Those are now at records about four times more than normal. Another purpose is dividend support. Another use is, um, of course, mergers. Um, uh, and uh, I would simply note, in, in our space, AT&T just went through this litigation where they talked about why they were spending over $100 billion on Time Warner Entertainment. They didn't talk at all about networks. They talked about data. They talked about changing market structures. And by the way, I give, they, they should have the right to spend their money the way they, they choose. But my point is there is zero, and I mean zero evidence, that saving money will then be used for CapEx anywhere else. And there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. Nothing the FCC is doing is going to change these priorities. Nothing the FCC has said has reflected they have learned anything. So uh, because the FCC and BDAC decided it knew the answers from the start and didn't want to learn anything, they came up with an answer that will not accomplish the goal of accelerating market deployment. Uh, and it actually asks nothing of the companies um, and only asks that the cities um, uh, sacrifice uh, to make this work. Uh, and so what we'll probably get is something uh, like this. Uh, in terms of the result. Now, I don't mean to argue that BDAC is 100% wrong. It's good that the process recommended the commission adopt a one-touch make-ready rule, which was actually recommendation 6.2 and 6.3 of the National Broadband Plan. But I say that because when, when we started the National Broadband Plan, I had no idea that we would actually recommend um, one-touch make-ready. I didn't even know what one-touch make-ready is. Perhaps you all don't. It just is a process of lowering the cost of um, uh, climbing a pole and attaching a fiber. Um, it is similar, as you know, we, a lot of you probably know about uh, dig once, uh, which is just a more efficient way of, of laying fiber. This is the equivalent of climb once. That idea, like all the ideas uh, in the National Broadband Plan, actually came out of about 30 workshops, public workshops that we did, and about 40 public notices where we asked for written submissions. They were designed to teach our team something new, and they did. Um, another example of my ignorance is a project I'm working now to develop uh, something equivalent to the National Broadband Plan uh, for refugees around the world. Uh, the final product will bear little resemblance to my original thought on the subject, which was the problem is a lot like the National Broadband Plan, um, which turned out to be only 50 percent right, which is another way of saying I was 50 percent wrong, uh, which back when I was in school was a failing grade. But uh, the big shocker here is that if you actually study something, you, it can turn out to be quite different than you, than you thought. And that brings us to smart cities, because what we really mean by smart cities is a city that constantly learns. And uh, it's not that the city suddenly one day does everything better. It's that it learns a little bit every day. In the same way that the mayor was just talking about when the city went down it had to find new ways to come up, it was a 30-year success. Uh, it looks like it was overnight, but it was actually constant learning, constantly trying to figure out what, what is going on that we can make better. And so the cities, after all, is a commons that we share. There are lots of things that we do together. Um, and all of this data from the networks and the sensors and the data points um, uh, hopefully make the city a better place, the economy stronger, the society stronger. We don't know yet the optimal way to do that, but we see in cities, like in the mayor, an earnest effort to figure it out without prejudgment. We see it all around the world with mayors, council members, staffers coming to conferences like this, not to confirm what they already know, but to humbly and openly obtain information they need uh, to improve their community. Uh, I see my friend Jim Stegman from CostQuest out here. Jim did a lot of data for us when we did the National Broadband Plan. He's doing work for others. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing commercial advertising for, uh, for Jim. Rather, what I'm saying is the kind of the nature of what Jim does is very data-driven, improves thinking, but it's not the kind of thinking that's going on in Washington, D.C. And so I, 
uh, uh, let me just uh, start to close by saying that the city should become smart. They also need to become wise. You'll, there'll be some discussion later on about digital divide, but also inclusion. And part of the problem with data is data can reinforce pre-existing conditions. And uh, the Obama White House did a very good, uh, did actually two reports on the danger of using algorithms. Um, they can be very helpful in improving a lot of uh, city services, but they can also reinforce um, patterns which uh, exist for historical reasons uh, and are very problematic. So my closing is how I opened with why I trust cities more. There is actually the most significant meta theme about governance in the United States today is that the federal government is dysfunctional and disrespected, but that local governments are responsive, proactive, effective, and respected in building communities. And one sees this in the press, um, different books that come out, uh, academic writings. It also shows up in polling data where about 70 plus percent of the public trust their local um, uh, governments, whereas less than 20 percent trust um, uh, the federal government. Uh, so it causes me to believe that the key to moving this country forward is giving local governments more authority and more freedom. So let me end on a bipartisan note um, uh, by quoting someone who is not a cousin, uh, but share, I share a last name with, but he's a very conservative guy who I disagree with a lot, but I absolutely agree with, uh, but very thoughtful, and uh, wrote a book on where our country should go and said the absence of easy answers is precisely the reason to empower multiplicity of problem solvers throughout our society rather than hoping that one problem solver in Washington gets it right. Uh, that is a great summation of the problem with the current FCC. Uh, it is also a great explanation of what you all are doing here and why this conference is so important. Thank you, Deb, for uh, holding it, and uh, thank you very much uh, for, for you all being here. You, uh, you don't have a clicker to pause me or move me forward, but it wouldn't work anyway. Yeah. Um, I'm Chris Mitchell with, the, uh, with Next Century Cities. I'm the director of policy there, uh, which I do uh, within my capacity at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance out of Minneapolis. And Blair, the first question that I wanted to ask you is if we go back to the National Broadband Plan and you put yourself back in that frame of mind, um, what have you changed your mind about since then? And it doesn't have to be something in the plan, but just from that time frame. Um, there are lots of things we actually didn't do in the plan that I wish we had done. I wish we had done something on privacy. Um, we actually tried and it, we just qu couldn't get it done quickly enough. I wish we had done something on interference in devices. Um, it's kind of a technical issue, but one I think is really important for spectrum policy. We did a lot on spectrum policy. I wish we had done more on shared spectrum. Fortunately, the president, there was a presidential commission that a year later started to look at that. Those are all technical things. I think the, the, the really big thing, and it's influenced a lot of what I've done since then, was you know any, any broadband plan, and by the way, this is true for the refugee one I'm working on, three fundamental questions uh, that the 156 national broadband plans have addressed. How do you get affordable, abundant bandwidth everywhere? How do you get everybody on it? And how do you use it to better deliver public goods and services? As we were writing it and as we were thinking about it, I started to realize that those three questions are answered much more at the local level than they are at the national level. The national level on the first one, spectrum, is really important, and that has to be federal. But the mechanics of getting affordable, abundant bandwidth everywhere relates a lot to what cities do. Um, uh, certainly getting them on, getting people on, I think the, the local efforts to improve adoption have proved generally more successful um, and then uh, the third one, utilization, delivering public goods and services. Cities are doing a far more effective job, I think, of, of utilizing the platform than the federal government. I could go into where I think some of those differences are. But the, but the big change really is fo changing a focus from the federal to the local level to actually accomplish things. It's definitely speaking my language uh -huh. uh, in both organizations. Um, but as before we get to the local level, I'd like to just stay at the state and federal level for a second. And, and I, I think this is a question that's really well suited to you because you've 
I think unintentionally angered a lot of rural advocates over the years as you've sometimes intentionally sure <laughs> <laughs> well in particular I think you've noted that if we're spending thousands of dollars per household in rural areas to improve internet access yeah. uh, we're not really doing much in the um, in the cities where there's also a need for some investment a different kind of investment often right so what will it take for the state and federal government to make resources available in urban areas to improve uh, whether it's internet access or adoption um, so we uh, that is, I, I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer it in a short way, but I'm going to try. We have a big political problem of rural urban power in state legislatures. Um, and uh, just to put some numbers on it, which are approximately right, um, we have about 20 million Americans who lack broadband in rural America, and we're spending order of magnitude, I would say, six to seven billion a year to help them. We have uh, 80 million Americans who can't afford broadband, and we're spending maybe a third of that to try to help them. So the, the point is we're spending a lot more money per person in rural um, areas. Um, uh, I have pissed them off because I have pointed out that they keep thinking that um, you know all government is bad and we should deregulate government, and they, they send people to Washington to do that while they are taking enormous amounts of money uh, from that same federal government. They don't like that when I point that out. But the, but but within the state, I, I think the politics is, makes it very difficult. And I think when you look at the kind of symbolic nature of our political system these days, uh, and I would note that the, you know, uh, um, and again, I don't, I don't mean to be partisan, but it's hard not to be. You have um, a lot of Republicans saying, the war on poverty didn't work, therefore we should kill all the programs. And then you have the Trump administration saying, we have now won the war on poverty, therefore we should kill all the programs. At the same time that we literally are spending over a trillion dollars to, of you know, future money. I mean, look at what's happening in the national debt, that's all driven by the tax bill. Um, to, uh, to create the healthier stocks through stock buybacks. When you have that kind of thing, you're not thinking about how do we actually solve the problem? You're thinking about which constituencies you're trying to serve. So I think it's actually, you know, I, I don't have a lot of hope um, in, in, frankly, the state legislatures right now, but I do have a lot of hope uh, for local governments, which seem to be much more grounded in reality. One of the, the best things about uh, Chairman Jenikowski is that he gives many of us an opportunity to find someone to criticize very strongly uh -huh. who uh, was appointed by a uh, Democratic president. Yes, I'm very bipartisan in my criticism <laughs> that way. He carries as well a lot as of that jokes. weight. Yeah, he, yeah uh, Julius does carry well that way. Um, I, I wanted to note that um, you noted that uh, rural areas tend to vote Republican, but as you and I both know, it's not a monolith. Right. You know many of the folks that are organizing with uh, different opinions. And then as later folks will discuss, there's ways of spending money in rural areas more effectively to get better connect connections out yeah, there. Absolutely. So I don't want to leave people with the impression that we're saying that rural money is wasted or that it is not a good investment, but it's to point out the imbalance in that there is no state that is considering an urban investment in broadband, to my knowledge. No, that's, that's, that, that's right, and I think that's a really important point. And, and again, if 5G were the national security and economic threat that many people in Washington have said, then why don't we have a, let's call it a $3 billion fund, which would not be that much money from a Washington, D.C. perspective, to essentially do a race to the top kind of program for doing what Lincoln, Nebraska did um, uh, to do a dark fiber um, uh, build out, which would vastly accelerate uh, the deployment. The real problem with 5G, when you look at it as I do from a Wall Street perspective, you know, spectrum is definitely an issue, and the FCC is doing some things I agree with on in terms of spectrum, some things I disagree with. But, but the biggest problem is a ubiquitous fiber backhaul. That's, that's the economic challenge. The reason the Chinese are arguably ahead of us is because they put a lot more fiber in. The same reason for Korea and Japan, etc. Um, why not do that? Uh, there are a lot of reasons we're not doing that. But my point is, if you're not doing that. Why are you then saying the challenge is so great, we have to take the extraordinary step of having the federal government essentially take over the city function of managing construction? 
There's a, a lot of people out there, um, in, including in every one of the cities that are represented here. Um, there are people who will say, uh, this isn't a good place for cities to get involved in any level, and that we just need to wait, and good things will come. Yeah. What do you say? Um, uh, no, I think you're wrong. Uh, I think, um, uh, the, look, that's, that's not an unreasonable point of view in the following sense, that these networks are fundamentally uh, funded by the private sector, by market forces. What we saw since, one of the things we saw on the plan that we didn't articulate well, but there were strategic reasons for not articulating it well, um, was the thing that led to Google Fiber, which is that from about, um, from about 1993 to 2007, cable and telco constantly were upgrading to compete against each other. And in 2007, that basically stopped because Verizon's Fios was considered a, uh, a failure on Wall Street. And that led to what we might think of as a prisoner's dilemma in which cable and telco were uh, segmenting the market, cable getting what we might think of as the Nordstrom's part of the market, and telco getting what we might think of as the Walmart uh, value proposition. But in that situation, neither had an incentive to upgrade. Out of that discussion, Google Fiber arose as a way of causing upgrades to happen. And our point, and we saw this clearly with Google, and then with AT&T and CenturyLink and others, is that cities had to change their ways to make that investment viable. We were not dealing with the same kind of patterns that we were dealing with when the telcos arose in the early part of the last century, or cable arose in the 70s and 80s of the last century. So um, cities had, to, if they wanted to be part of the next generation, they had to take affirmative steps. And so you saw cities like Raleigh-Durham um, uh, take affirmative steps to attract people. And by the way, AT&T just announced that they were expanding by a couple of markets um, where they're doing 5G. Those are markets where the cities, a few years earlier, had made the investment climate more, um, uh, more effective, and therefore they, at t had fiber there, and that's why they can do 5G there. So what I would say to cities is there is definitely a danger of falling behind if you don't affirm, because of the market structure, if you don't take action you risk falling significantly behind. Let me, let me push in on that for a second, because I think someone could walk away from what you just said thinking if cities make it more attractive for companies to invest, that AT&T will invest. And I would actually say the dynamic is that Google and others invested, some small companies invested, and that AT&T doesn't really care about the actual how easy it is to invest. They're responding to a competitive threat, and that there's nothing cities can do when it comes to the larger incumbents except for motivating them by bringing in competition. Uh, that, that's a really great point. When we were doing uh, in the heart of gig.u, we identified six factors of which competition was one. It was the most important one. If, um, and, the, and the pause in Google Fiber, I think, has slowed things down. So your, your point is a good one. Um, nothing drives investment like competition. Having said that, there are various things that cities can do to lower CapEx, lower operating expenses, lower risk, which is actually something that's often ignored but very important, uh, increase revenues, increase systemic benefits. Uh, but the biggest, the biggest factor is actually competition. I want to take a question from the audience in a second. I'm going to um, let you think about your questions. Uh, Deb has a mic that she'll hand out. Um, but the, the question I wanted to ask you is, I, I certainly agree, and I think we've seen more and more people coming to the conclusion that mayors are our are, are best hope right now. That, to me, seems like, you know, for people, I know with, with your background, for instance, in which you want to see all Americans have better opportunities, um, it's great for cities, for people that are in cities that have forward-thinking mayors, city council members, commissioners. It's not so great for people who live in cities that don't have that. And so as we're celebrating these cities that are moving forward, are we not also condemning some people to be left in areas uh, where they're not moving forward? Uh, I, I, th I think that's a really good point, and I think you know a challenge, particularly for liberal Democrats like me, is how do you respond in this moment in time to drive an agenda that you uh, think think positive? And and by the way, let me just reiterate: on I've worked in a, with a lot of cities. I've never known what the political affiliation of any mayor I've worked with is. You know, this is this comes into the 
same kind of categories, picking up garbage or moving water or m moving anything, which is there are, there are better ways of doing it. So it really is um, uh, nonpartisan. But I would just note that people like me spent a lot of our youth talking about federal solutions and are now in a situation where we see uh, cities much more responsive uh, to, the, uh, to the needs of people. So it is a challenge. The, the one thing I will say is, one of the reasons I like working with cities is there is kind of a market mechanism at work, which is not true for the federal government. The federal government is the ultimate monopolist. There, I mean, that's, that, that's what it means to be a government. You have a monopoly uh, on things, things like violence, for example, or things like justice. And, um, uh, so whereas that's a problem, uh, I think it's very clear that a lot of cities started to duplicate what Kansas City was doing with Google Fiber um, uh, because they saw how it worked. In the same way, you know, I've, I've worked on Wall Street off and on for like 20 years. When a business figures out a really good business model, I'll, there's a lot of gravitational force to doing that. And I think mayors tend to imitate mayors. I don't know who. Well, I guess the president is imitating certain pe other national leaders uh, in other countries like Russia and Hungary and Philippines and things like that that, that he, he thinks is a good model for him. Um, uh, but um, if, if, if you laughed at that, I, we know what party you belong to. But, the, uh, uh, but, but my point is cities are much more responsive in a much quicker fashion than I think the federal government is. I might note, by the way, the federal government is, it's, it actually is really hard. I think it may get harder. I'll just say a quick thing. One of the things that will be completely ignored, I think, in the uh, confirmation hearings for Brett Kavanaugh is that he has adopted a point of view about uh, carriers having First Amendment rights. That if I send an email to a friend of mine saying, my Verizon service sucks, uh, the judge would regard that as Verizon speech, and they should not be compelled to carry that traffic. Um, and what that really means is that most of the regulation, almost all of the regulation of broadband uh, will be wiped out. Interesting. Um, uh, but again, you know, I think that leads to local responses uh, much more than national responses in terms of how do we have networks that actually offer people uh, what, they're, what they want to do? How do we have open, transparent, uh, free-flowing networks that really the internet was intended to be? So do we have a, a question? Let me, um, I think I saw this hand back here for, oh, Deb's already picked someone, so. <laughs> I was close by. Um, well, just but what, before you start, Deb, what time do we have? We have 10 minutes for questions. And I'll ask a very short question then. Uh, you talked a lot about the role of cities, Blair. What about the role of counties? Um, uh, it really depends on the nature of the state government. Uh, in some places, counties have exactly the same role. But networks are fundamentally regional. They are actually not divided. I mean, you know, I was in St. Louis a few weeks ago, 92 different uh, municipal jurisdictions in what you might think of as the region. Um, obviously, a regional approach is important. Um, the economics of scale are really important. And so, in certain places, counties can actually pl play a greater role. Having said that, it's usually the city that manages uh, the access to the rights of way. John. Hello. John um, Paya, who worked with me at the FCC and is now here in Pittsburgh. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, well, you may not think that after I ask questions. But, you know. um, <laughs> I would expect nothing less <laughs> than from you. A lot of those fiber deployments have been great for people who got them, but they've also created disparities within the yes. city. And I yeah. expect with 5G, this is going to be a big issue. Yes. Are there things that local governments ought to be thinking about yes. that they can and should be doing? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a great question. And look, this is part of the problem always when we make progress, which is are we making progress uh, for the few or the, you know, whatever. And, and when Google Fiber arose, um, there were a number of critics who said they should be required to build out everywhere. Google basically had a build a demand model, which is whereas they were obligated to build everywhere, that obligation really only kicked in when a certain percentage of people agreed to take the service. And um, part of the opposition was sincere, part of the opposition was funded by uh, their competitors who wanted to slow them down. And to their 
it, it is true, cable and the telcos were obligated to build everywhere, but they got a monopoly franchise. Which, by the way, if you had given that to Google, if, they, if you said you are the only company allowed to build a gigabit network, I'm sure they would have agreed to build everywhere. Um, but we don't do that, and we shouldn't do that. So your, your question is, do we, do we risk this? We absolutely do. There are a lot of different things that cities, I, I would urge cities to experiment with. You know, for example, some cities I've talked to have talked about having basically zero cost permitting in areas that are below a certain uh, adoption rate. Um, San Jose got AT&T and the other carriers to contribute to a digital divide fund. There are lots of different ways of doing it. The problem is if the FCC moves ahead the way I think they're going to do, all of those would be illegal. And so um, I think we need a, a lot of experimentation to do this. My God, the FCC sure talks a, about, a lot about the digital divide. But when you actually go into the details of what they're doing, they're not it does not look to me like they're actually helping. I'd like to just throw in something you can react to, and that's that I suspect that ultimately um, cities can do what they can to incent, but I think we're gonna see more and more cities that are expanding municipal infrastructure around the city for their own purposes, uh, maybe leasing it to others. And then I think the first logical thing we'll see is more public housing being connected, and then more of the lowest income areas of town where, this, where the, the local government is doing it itself, perhaps working with one or multiple ISPs in targeted arrangements in ways, we already see this with Digital C, there's several who are using um, a point-to-point uh, -point wireless to get on top of roof rooftops right. for this sort of thing, um, and in San Francisco is doing this as well. So um, that's, in, in some ways, I, I think incentives are not going to connect the lowest income areas. I think cities will have to deploy their own infrastructure, um, and it's just a question of how long they're going to wait to do it. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that and could have used those examples uh, from Cleveland, as you mentioned, or uh, what San Francisco is doing. But but my, my big point is we ought to have an attitude of let cities experiment with it because they bear the burden. And, and by the way, cities, they understand far better than the federal government that if everybody's connected, they can do their jobs better. So. We have five minutes, Deb. Right behind you, I think we have a question. And I want to say one other thing, which is that I'm always sensitive to being on stage and knowing that people who aren't on stage sometimes can get frustrated when a point of view is not represented. And I want to note that it's easy to take swipes at the Trump administration for people who have long opposed him. But I also want to be cognizant of the fact that we are seeing a rise around the world of, of uh, a certain kind of politics that's really damaging. And I don't, I don't think it's equally distributed among different political views. Um, but this is not the result of one person. In or, or one party. Fair point. Hi there. Uh, Mitsuko Herrera from Montgomery County, which is adjacent to Washington, D.C. Uh, we recently participated in a lobby day on Capitol Hill. One of the things we were talking about is the introduction of a bill called the Streamlined Act, which would essentially limit what local governments can charge to use both their right of way and the, the polls that they've installed in those areas to cost, and so I wanted to, a pervasive thing, there seem to be a lot of uh, varying opinions of what is cost. But it goes back to this idea, and you had a slide um, in there talking about this, this, this false assumption that if you cut costs, or in this case, if you give away public property, that it will lead to more competition. And what I'm curious is, given all of your experience, and you've got a slide showing that. What are things that we can be doing that help people understand that the market is leaving behind areas and that if you give money to the companies without any strings attached, there is no evidence showing that that gets deployed back into deployment. So is it just Craven, Washington, double speak that I'll say it, but I know it's not true? Or is there actually something that we can be doing to help educate people to understand that gutting these partnership deals like San Jose's and others is not gonna lead to multiple competitors and not gonna lead to multiple competitors in rural areas? Now, how much time do we have left? <laughs> Look, I. Um, I, 
I, I, I don't want to come off as a partisan. I am a partisan, but, but the point of speaking, uh, at least for me, I mean, I, no one's paying me to come here. This is just, just me trying to share lessons that I've learned uh, over the course of doing many different things. Um, uh, is because I feel that there is a lack of information. Now, I, I really don't want to go to the motives of those the, the folks that I'm kind of like making fun of. Um, I think in their own minds, they're doing the right thing. Um, I think part of the challenge, and by the way, the FCC is a very different institution than it was when I was there in the mid-90s and we did the 96 Act in which we did 110 rulemakings all with unanimous votes with a couple of minor exceptions. Um, but part of the reason, frankly, was because we had no congressional staffers on the commission. And once you put, the, the, the commission is now almost all ex-congressional staffers. And once you do that, you have a very different kind of way of thinking about the problem. It's very press driven. It's very um, soundbite driven. It's not very analytic driven. Um, it is astonishing to me that we can adopt these kind of myths and, and I wouldn't say, you know, a part of it's about competition. It's just simply that there is this myth that if you save company m money anywhere, they immediately turn around and spend it on either CapEx or new jobs. It's just, I'm sorry, there's no evidence that that's true. How you get, the, how you break through, uh, whether it be the latest Twitter rant or the latest foreign news or the latest uh, investigatory news, you know, that's a very complicated thing. But I do think that um, there are people of goodwill on the Hill. I don't mean to be totally critical of the Hill, uh, but they tend to be rather simplistic and represent, um, you know, people who contribute to campaigns. And I think this, th this bill, and I, I deeply admire some of the supporters of the bill, and I'm kind of surprised that they're supporting it. I obviously wouldn't. Um, I simply would say, I think we have to, um, uh, we, we have to have more cities like San Jose that demonstrate we actually don't need the federal government to do this and there are significant advantages to not having the federal government involved, particularly at this moment in time, as we try to figure out better solutions to these problems. But, it, but, but breaking through the kind of Washington morass and, you know, again, uh, particularly in the age where Citizens United has meant that there's just, it's so um, problematic, the amount of money that campaigns are costing and the ways in which unseen money are going into campaigns. I just think it's really hard. Deb, we have one last question. Um, thank you for your sharing, you know, your background and everything. I have two, it's kind of two parts. I just wanted to hear your opinion on uh, Link NYC, uh, pros and cons, and then also whether or not municipalities and cities should consider the, the revenue benefits of data marketplaces that can be created with all of this data that they can build out. Oh, those are two great questions. Link NYC, for those of you who don't know, what happened was the city essentially um, realized that they had great fiber connectivity going to phone booths, but nobody was using phone booths, so they created these Wi-Fi hotspots and essentially, with, with a subsidiary of Google, actually, uh, and are creating um, both kind of an advertising space, but also a place for people to do it. It's it's been interesting. They've come to some you know various problems that you might have anticipated of pornography use of pornography and some, a bunch of other things. But it's it's the fundamental impulse, which is how do we take existing assets and upgrade them to the technology of today, I think is exactly right. I'm not sure it has that much, um, um, there aren't that many cities that have that kind of phone booth connectivity. Or foot traffic to drive the advertising. Or, or foot traffic to drive the advertising. Uh, London does, San Francisco maybe, but, but not a lot of others do. But the point, and, and you basically raise this, which is cities for their own purposes are going to be laying a lot more fiber, and then how do you share that? How do you make it available to others? How do you get public benefit? This leads to your second point, which is um, should the cities be in the same, you know, companies sell a lot of data. Facebook sells a lot of uh, personal data, right? Um, uh, what's the appropriate role for cities? That's a really complicated thing. I would be very, um, 
I think if I were in the city, I would probably err on um, not, not selling uh, any of the data. However, I think we have to be sympathetic. Um, uh, w one of the things a city official told me upon hearing the FCC's commissioner say uh, every city deserves a fair shot at 5G and therefore we have to lower the amount that cities get off of their rights of way. Uh, he said, why the hell, what, what is it about a fair shot that means that I have to give money to Verizon instead of paying for another cop? What's fair about that? And his point is a good one. I think we have to be sympathetic to city officials who are constantly making these trade-offs. Um, and so uh, if a city believes that they can get a few extra cops or school teachers or whatever by selling some data, I, I give them the right to make that choice. I may make the choice differently than some other people might do it, but uh, would I explore ways of doing it? Um, it's, it is complicated. I'll just one, one other example. Lots of cities have done deals with Wave, which is a private company, a subsidiary of Google. Uh, may, maybe many of you use it. It uses everybody who uses it. Um, Waze. Waze. Yes, Waze. W A Z E. Um, uh, to do traffic. Well, they're essentially helping drive a certain kind of monopoly to that um, entity. On the other hand, they're improving the way they do traffic and they're, you know, and eventually, by the way, we're going to get to this problem with Uber and Lyft and we're kind of replacing some of the ways we do public transportation. This is why I deeply believe in experimentation and giving the cities freedom to do this. I trust the people on a city council to make the trade-offs much, much more than I trust the five commissioners or at this point four at the FCC to understand what those trade-offs are. Thank you, Blair. Thank you. As always, a pleasure. Have a great conference.